Live from the 607, it is the one and only Ocho Duro Parlay Hour with your host, Ken M, Soundman Galore, JR, and the Padawan J, bringing you all the sports information you need to know. It has been far too long, folks, but we are back. It is the one and only Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. I'm your host, Ken M. Sitting to my left is back from L.A., Sam Angalore, JR. I'm right here. He's right here, folks. He came back in one piece, but he'll have a quick update about what he was doing out in L.A. To my right, another man who went on a quest and failed, well, do we say epically? Because I don't know if we can hey, or not. Hey, I'm still standing. They're not here. Yeah, for now, my friend. That is the only one intern, Padawan J. Folks, it's been far too long. How the hell are you? We're doing pretty good. We're excited to talk to you. We have a very, very special guest in the studio that we're not just going to have to wait just, just a little bit longer, folks. Common man Vince Ciotoli is in the studio, ready to talk some MMA. He has an incredible story that you need to get familiar with. Big fight coming up in August. And there's a big fight card this weekend. We're going to have his input on as well. But right now, we need to get caught up. JR, you were out in L.A.? Yes, I was, actually. Anything you want to say about the Conor Floyd extravaganza? Oh, man. I could rant on for about 30 seconds. No. I agree. That was it. All I'm going to just chime in two cents. Should have stopped after Toronto. That's all I'm going to say. <sighs> yeah. We're not going to waste a lot of time because we got to get caught up because we really, really want to get to talking to Vince about it. Conor Floyd, it is what it is. The hype machine was the media circus you thought it was. It got a little crazier as the week progressed. Who cares? That's kind of the feeling we have right now. That's all we're going to say. It's not Canelo Triple G. That's going to be in September. But the fight is going to be coming up. Speaking of fights going on, there is something going on in Cleveland that is kind of taking the attention. It, it, it's almost playing out like a House of Cards episode. Somebody may have gotten blocked on their phone. Yeah, I don't know. The entire owning the entire owner's staff of Cleveland right now on Kyrie's phone. I post, awesome. I posted a blog about this, and I'm still sitting here trying to make some sense of what the heck is going on with Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, and as the Cavs crumble. I don't get it. I mean, they started off the month very badly with David Griffin, you know, the contract not getting worked out. He bounces as GM. And then suddenly, you know, there's talk, okay, LeBron's thinking about leaving again, which, I mean, that's going to happen anytime you have a superstar at the end of his contract. Oh, it's well, such an well, epic plus, FU, and it's awesome. Well, and plus, it's like, oh, we're in on Paul George. Oh, we're in on Gordon Hayward. Uh, 0 for 2. Yeah, they tried getting another big free agent to come over to Cleveland, but I don't really think they had that much capital um, to go sign. They side. did. No. Former MVP, D. Rose. Oh, well, well, come on, hello. Okay, let us break that down, <laughs> shall we? The only pre- people I don't think I want the to only get person happy about that are, are the doctors in Cleveland, uh, and the Golden State Warriors because they're laughing their rear off in California. Going really? Mm, that's that's your savior. If Derek, that's your savior, if Derrick Rose can be a shell of his former Chicago Bull MVP self, they might have a steal. Time out. I don't. Time out. Coming from the Knicks fan who watched this train wreck unfold, you gotta let me finish, brother. <laughs> I was going somewhere. Pump your bricks, child. Yeah, right off We're the end of that clip. No, but that's the thing. But as a Knicks fan, I saw what he had this season. I'm not really sold on that he's going to be the, the key to solving the Warriors puzzle. I just don't get it. I, I mean, I understand it. He's a name. He does have you know a little chip on his shoulder. Maybe being out of the New York limelight might be the case. I don't know. I think he thought his value was going to be a lot more higher on the free agent market. $23 million down to two. Yeah. J.J. Reddick got Somebody a better deal. Somebody threw in the towel. J.J. Somebody Reddick, thrown in the towel. J.J. Reddick got a better deal. I know I'm still arguing uh, about that. I like that deal, though. Yeah. but due, That's for another day. But due to all that as well, I mean, that was kind of the Band-Aid to cover up whatever Kyrie all of a sudden wants out of Cleveland. Yeah, this it's, yeah, this just came out of nowhere. It's like all of a sudden, it's like a week or two ago, it's like, oh, yeah, he wants out of Cleveland, and here are his potential places he wants to go. Mm-hmm. What was it? Minnesota, New York, San Antonio, and I'm forgetting one. No, there was a bunch of different yeah, there places. Was a, there was a bunch of places, but here's the caveat: he don't have any say in it. He's got a he's got no no trade clause, so they can send him. Around. He can go be playing on Utah next year. 
He's got no say. He has no say. I mean, that's the thing. When you have uh, all-star athletes are trying to call their shot to where they want to go, I mean, the teams, it's a weird day and age with, you know, how trades are done, I guess is the only way I can describe it. And, and it gets weirder and weirder as the days go on. I mean, earlier this week you had the story that, you know, were they in front of each other, LeBron James would, you know, whoop his you know backside. And then you had this, you know, the latest one today is supposedly the Cavs can't even get a hold of Kyrie. He won't answer their calls. Yeah, it, it's just getting weirder and weirder. And now more media outlets are trying to hype up, well, he doesn't want to play with him, so he's not going to talk to him. Well, he's devastated, doesn't want to talk to him. It's like pick up the phone and call each other. You know, meet up in like a public place or something and hammer it out. If you don't want to be there, you don't want to be there. Okay, fine. I don't understand how you go from back-to-back-to-back finals and all of a sudden you're like, nah, I want out. Well, yeah, but when you think two years ago when he hit that epic three to get the first Believe One title, Mm -hmm. everyone's like, oh, well, LeBron James carried him. Well, he Kyrie was one who hit that three. Yeah, he's the one playing defense on that team. Well, I think, I think and it gets to, overshadowed a, well, a ton. Well, and the other thing that I f- was watching Sports Center the other morning, and the thing they brought up is you got to look at it. he's what three years into the NBA, four years, give take, give, give or take. You know, he had he came in, was drafted, you know, number one overall or whatever it was, and you're like, oh, you're going to be the face of the franchise. He's had how many coaches go through there? He's now on his second GM, and you know, in the middle of all this is, oh, hey, LeBron James is back, and he's now in charge of things. Well, you have to defer. I mean, I'm sorry. LeBron is one of your top three players in the NBA right now. I don't care who you are. I mean, he's done more to earn that spot that if he wants to call that shot, he has to call that shot. Now, I think what they should have done is if this was going to be such a big conflict bringing him back in, you should have contacted Kyrie and said, are you going to be okay about this? If you really were like that caring, I guess, about hurting somebody's feelings about it. But, folks, if you're updating your team and making them more contendable to win a title, don't you go get the best players involved and see, you know, make your pieces work? I mean, that's the argument you got to say. You can't be really, oh, I'm sorry. He's, he's where he's getting overshadowed. And- I'm sorry. But if they, if LeBron James says, I want to come back to Cleveland, and they have to call Kyrie, and Kyrie's like, ah, you know, I don't really know if I want him to come back, then you're gone. Yeah. Bye. I don't see think, ya. I don't even think it's a, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> see the, ya. Old, the only scenario this makes sense of him saying I want out is if he is so in his head that he believes LeBron is going to leave and LeBron's going to control his narrative, he's going to get out before LeBron gets out and I'm controlling my own narrative. Maybe, but at the same point, if LeBron leaves, Kyrie wants to be the center of the offense, why don't you stay there? I mean, what are you missing other than him? I mean, Grant, it's a big hole, but if you're saying that you want to be the focal point of the offense – Everything would come through you then. So why do you want out if you think he's leaving? Hey, I don't blame him for being a little salty. Him and uh, you know LBJ and D Rose are having a little bromance out in L.A. right now. So, yeah, no, no, or it, Las Vegas. So it's it's, it's a yeah. Well, LeBron Bye-bye. LeBron is kind of like, well, he wants to cut out. I'm gonna get somebody new, and we're gonna kind of see where we go from here. I understand that, but it's like at the same token, it's like you're in a great winning situation. If you want to go to a different franchise and see if you can you know make your legacy there, great. But I think how this is all coming about. Is just messy. Clean I think it's and funny. Simple. Like I said, Golden State's just laughing, going, hey, whatever your train wreck is you've got going on, psh, good yeah. for you. And how do you go from being the finals, you know, back-to-back-to-back years, and then suddenly the, everything just implodes what? in, what, six weeks? Well, he wants, hey, he wants to be the man. Hey, I mean, more power to him. Rightfully so. Especially Can't if fault you, him on that. Especially if he comes to the Knicks, oh, which boy. I'm all right with. Why? So Porzingis isn't going to be there. No, it, it'll be him and Porzingis. That would be it. And then they'll go get a third piece in the off season. Just resign. Well, you've still got Noah. You like owe him I said, like thirty will, million dollars. Like I said, we will go get another piece in the off season, and all will be right in <laughs> Manhattan. Yeah. Okay. We'll see what happens there. Mm-hmm. Speaking yeah. of happenings, there's a little movement going on in the uh, world of Major League Baseball. Pad, you got some news on that? Yeah, we got some trades going on. Of course, the trade deadline is fast approaching. Uh, Yankees last week traded. Uh, for Todd Frazier, David Robertson, and another uh, relief pitcher from Chicago. Really shore up the bullpen, give him one of the best bullpens in the game. A lot of strikeouts, you know, which is, I would say, over the last few weeks, been really one of their weak spots in, in the team is bullpen. You know, you got the pitcher who does eh, and you turn it over to the bullpen, and they give up like eight runs. 
So, you know. Uh, you've also had uh, Lucas Duda of the New York Mets traded to the Tampa Bay Rays for a prospect. Jared, I like it. Jared I love is it. happy about it. Love it. And then the news going around is uh, supposedly ev- anyone and everyone on the Detroit Tigers is available for trade. They're uh, going fire sale. Fire sale, fire sale. Everyone was, including Justin Verlander. Uh, Ver- I saw a quote from Verlander the other day. He said, I haven't seen this many scouts around watching me since I was in college. So you got that. And then also supposedly you Darvish of the Texas Rangers is on the trading block. Not sure where, but uh, his name has been thrown around. There's a lot of movement going ah. on. It's that time of year. Teams are you know trying to see, okay, what pieces do we need to you know make our puzzle work? Two quick blurbs. The you Darvish thing, he's had three terrible, terrible outings. Mm-hmm. His most recent, even including today, as we speak, he gave up another eight earned oh. in three. Sounds like a Met. We could probably go get him. Two, Verlander, I hate to say it. I, I saw a report earlier that the Dodgers are looking. Man, Kershaw won Verlander two. Shoot. That's the kind of thing you do Shoot. in a video game. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, Shoot. that's video game stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. I get Kershaw's out four to six weeks with back problems, but I'm sorry. As a Met fan who watched, who was in person on three days rest, rest when he two hit the Mets in city field for a clincher, yeah. Trust oh, me. Oh, trust if, me. No, no worries there. Oh, if if I'm a team, God, if he I'm threw a, 104 pitches on three days rest and gave up three hits. If I'm a one fan, of them was a I'm home a run. That was the team, only run we had. If I'm a fan of a team who can go get Justin Verlander, or Justin Verlander, or and Ugh. yes, yes, yeah, no, I just yeah, you got to go get him, whatever it costs. You, he's a wily veteran. It's, so. a, it's a no-brainer if you if you can afford to pull it off. I mean, I think for a team like the Yankees, where they could, you know, I heard a rumor about an even swap with him and Jacoby Ellsbury, which I'd make that deal in about 0.3 seconds. I, you know, you got to go yeah. get him. I mean, uh, we it, know people it, who do it faster. Yeah, but you have to you see what you can do and build up your team and do that. I mean, I think it makes a good move. I think he's going to be the big name if he gets moved. In true Yankee fashion, you'll trade him and then give him a huge 12-year overpaid CC contract, and he'll be a bust. Not necessarily. Ooh. I I don't think they're in the mood because, I mean, mm. right now they're bringing up a lot of their team from the farm system. I think that that's where the focus is going to be. I You're think- welcome. Their scouts told them that us Mets were doing that, now you finally realize you stock oh. the farm team, it works. Well, they got a lot it of guys works. coming up from the farm team because a lot of guys in the majors are getting hurt. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a trial by fire, but, you know, led by Mr. Aaron Judge. This I think they'll true. be okay. All rise. But we'll see what happens as we kind of go through. And we're just going to quickly touch upon this weekend, local minute. Really kind of everybody's coming back from baseball, you know, all-star break. Rumble Ponies are doing their thing. Pat, yeah, you got some? Yeah, Rumble Ponies are second place. Solid soul control second place. 12 games behind the Trenton Thunder, who are really running away with the division. So Yeah, but, you know, they're contending for the last playoff spot, so we wish them well. They're going to be having a home stand this weekend, so go out and check them out if you're in the 607 area. And also Saturday, the Binghamton Devils are unveiling their logo, and they're going to have a nice little press conference downtown at the arena so make sure to check it out if you into that folks we gotta get going because coming down the stairs right now is the common man vince ciatoli we're gonna come back talk a little mma with him here on the ocho Duro parlay hour And we are back. Folks, we have a special presentation for you here. August 12th, Seneca Niagara Casino, King of the Cage. There's a big MMA card going down. And I know there's one going on this weekend with John Jones. But we have another local MMA fighter in the house. Please give a warm welcome to the common man, Vince Ciatoli. Oh, man. Oh, man. What is up, guys? Thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming on the show. First, Vince, fill our audience in on uh, who you are. You know, how'd you go? You know, growing up here in the six oh seven. Basic information. Sorry. Basically, like my style, my story is unlike a lot of other guys. I didn't play sports growing up. I was a fat kid. I was a nerd. I was a dork. Uh, I read comic books. Ain't was nothing like, wrong with reading comic books. Oh no, 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 no I still that out. Oh, I still do. Sound around. What's up? Um, totally, just not an athlete. D- hated. Everything. I even hated gym class. What kid hates gym class? Yeah. So uh, I know a few. I uh, <laughs> I uh, as I got older, I uh, started falling into some really bad habits, really bad eating habits, really bad uh, drinking habits. Uh, 
pretty much just assumed I was going to be just an overweight fat kid for the rest of my life and uh, was a huge MMA fan by that same token. And uh, one day, my buddy Mike Hopko, he uh, met this uh, one fighter, Alex, who uh, owns another gym. We don't train together at the moment. I don't know. I don't know my love for him. Alex and I, uh, he uh, they linked up and uh, he called me. He's like, guess what? We're going to go train in MMA. So oh, really? It was literally like that. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, all right. No, sure. So first class, it was love at first sight, man. Love at first sight. That's awesome. So your your buddy Mike got you involved in it. I mean, did you grow up watching the sport pretty much, or is it, was it just kind of like he just called and was like, "Hey, I got something you want to try," and you're like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" No, I was a diehard. I used to be like before all the uh, <clears throat> blows to the head. I was like MMA Rain Man. You give me a name, I could tell you who he fought, when he fought, how tall he was, what he what he weighed. It was it was insane. What was the first fight that got you hooked? The first fight I remember watching was actually. It was uh, Matt Sarah, no Matt Hughes versus Hayato Sakurai UFC 36. Ooh. We had one of those uh, fun, fun little uh, black boxes, and you and I just was looking. I'm like, whoa, what is this? And it was real. Just, I see this Asian guy getting the crap pounded out of him by this big guy. I'm like, oh man. My mom's like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, uh, don't uh, turn this off. You don't want to watch this. So, all right, so. You know, the it, it kind of spurred some things. And then a few years later, as a lot of us have, uh, a lot of us saw Ultimate Fighter Season 1. Forrest Griffin, Stefan Bonner, Ken Flo, Diego, Kosh, Chek, Lieben. That was hook, line, sinker. I was in. I think that whole season of The Ultimate Fighter, I think if anybody was watching that at some point, they immediately became UFC and MMA fans. Oh, absolutely. I think that that whole season, I don't think they can ever recapture the magic that was that season by any means because that fight and i just remember that night and i think i've talked about this on a previous show when stefan and forrest fought i remember my Ooh. phone blowing up and people were like are, are you watching this and i remember like i was texting people at the same time like are you watching this it is that epic so i mean i could definitely see how that would be a spark for you to get in so like i said you went you know got called from uh, your buddy there started training how did that go about well, uh, the first class, I was horribly out of shape, so I guessed I'd throw jab crosses and stuff. So <laughs> the striking took a while to go, but uh, jiu-jitsu and that kind of thing, that was just like I gravitated immediately towards that. So I just kept training, kept training, kept training, and before I knew it, here comes 30 pounds. Here comes 40 pounds off. I was 270 pounds at the time. So boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, I'm doing a grappling tournament, 190 pounds. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. So hold up. So I just want to make sure our audience is listening, which, by the way, if you're following us on social media, hashtag common man ODPH. Started at MMA at weighing 270 pounds. How? And then you lost how much by your first grappling tournament? That was about six. It was about 70 pounds. 70 pounds. Yeah. How many months did this take? Uh, it probably took mm, about nine months. So nine months dropped 70 pounds by getting involved in MMA. That is incredible. That's insane. Yeah. I went from, it's like I think to tell people, uh, I went from doing nothing seven days a week to working out two to three hours, five, six days a week. So it was just little changes to my diet. And this thing, it was like boom, 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 boom. I couldn't stop it if I wanted to. I didn't, but. And with switching the diet, was that like a real problem for you, or is that? Oh man, to this day, even still, like I'm, uh, I don't really drink too much. I'm not a smoker, not a drinker, not a really a drugger. Um, I love food, man. I will sit down. I will. I love food. Like that's preach, my brother. Preach. Yeah, you're, you're talking to the right choir. He's speaking here. my language. Yeah. yeah. I see. You know, I'm like, oh, what's, what's going on with that pizza over there? Like, I, I you, know, you know, put the liquor away. Let's let's order some food. Let's do this. You know, that's my kind of trip tonight. Gotcha. So, some I try to keep in check today, but no, I, that's completely understandable. I mean, it's definitely like you know, especially being an athlete, being you know, to where your sport is, your weight in a sense, you know, that's a part of it. You know, it's got to be very difficult to try maintaining and keeping up your figure, you know, for that purpose, you know, for the different weight classes. Oh yeah, it's uh, some I've had some nightmarish cuts, man, <laughs> As, which I will talk about at uh and then later question but yeah okay there have been some rough cuts <laughs> I, I was gonna say well because you figure if you said you started at 270 yeah and then dropped 70 pounds so you're right around 200 pounds is going to your first grappling tournament yeah and then how was it for your first tournament oh god i got smoked <laughs> got really bad uh first thing i go in there against this guy from like 10 plant rochester 10 plant jiu-jitsu rochester what up herzog and this dude was just a gorilla he like firemen's carried me a rear naked choke me like boom boom so i'm like oh well there's that, and then this uh, other kid I grappled just beat me on points. He, he wasn't all that good, but he was better than me. So that was my first experience. I'm like, well, losing sucks. 
Yeah, I was going to say, how did they, you know, give you a little motivation for the next round? Oh, or, yeah. You know, did you, or did you go like, you know what, I'm having second thoughts about this whole thing? Or yeah, I mean, it, it motivated the hell out of me. I was just like, I, I got tunnel vision. I was like, I want to be good at this. That is awesome. So then going from the first grappling tournament, how long did it take for you to get, you know, more involved, you know, doing more tournaments? Was, you know, what was your approach going and, you know, moving forward for, you know, getting your basic, you know, baby steps going involved in MMA? It was right around that time, too. Um, I was just training hard, and the guys on the fight team started taking notice of me. Like, hey, you know, you want to come train with us? Come work out with us? I'm like, oh, well, okay, all right. So uh, my first real sparring experience, it was Hopko and I, and my nose to this day just leaks everywhere. But, oh, man, it was just blood all over the place. Oh, man. It's just a – it was bad. And then uh, after that, like, they're like, okay, well, you know, you're kind of now, and my responsibility was getting uh, the two big guys. We had a 205 and 190-pounder uh, getting there ready for their fights. Ooh, that was uh, that was a baptism of fire right there. And uh, eventually – Became a little bit more seasoned with it. Just realized that you're going to get hit no matter what. You know, n- nobody's out there, Anderson Silva, anyone in the gym. So, and uh, that just kind of wet my appetite even more. I'm like, man, I want to, you know, I want to fight. I want to do this. You know, because that was just a pipe dream for me. That was just a pipe dream. I never thought I would ever get the opportunity to, much less go to a gym, let alone fight. So I do another grappling tournament, do another one. And then around October, it was about a year and a half. They're like, hey, yeah, we, we got you fight. I was like, oh. All right. So a year and a half, just to recap for our listeners. So a year and a half, like you, you started at 270, immediately started going to the gym, immediately started changing the diet, just got motivated. Like I'm going to really make a difference and really kind of make a statement if I'm going to be doing this. Got in the first grappling tournament, you said was the time frame there about a year? A little under a year, yes. A little under a year. And then by the time you went to your second one, you get a little more season, you're taking a little more shots, which – all right, so by the way, for our listeners, how – yeah, I mean, there's no probably not a good shot to take, but how did you know, like, okay, this is, like, for real, for real? Like, was there, like, a moment in training in your first sparring session? You're like, okay, this this is going down, like, this moment of clarity, so to speak. It was just the boom, you know, you wear those small gloves, man, and even though they're, like, seven ounces and padded, they still suck. So I was like, oh, oh, all right, well, this is happening. Let's do this. And it was just, like, it, like something switched on in my head, and I just came forward like a maniac which wasn't the smartest thing to do, which, but no, it was, it was just like the first punch was like, okay, you're going to get hit. You're going to get hit a lot. Just deal with it. Just Easy. deal with it. And then, so about a year and a half, then you went to your second tournament. Yeah. Correct. Uh, actually, it was a little under, it was a little over a year. I went to my second tournament, which was in Ithaca. Okay. So second in the gi and the no gi. And then that, which that was just like, pew, that was just, I was fired up. I was jazzed up. Can you explain to our listeners, in case they're not familiar, what is gi and what is no gi? Gi jiu-jitsu is traditional jiu-jitsu. It's, you know, it's you put the, uh, we call them pajamas. You put the PJs on, and basically there's a lot more things you can do that you can do in no gi, and it's vice versa. You can, like, choke them with that. You can, you know, play different guards and stuff. It's good. I like it to a point, but it's not my main sport. It gets you really good control. It gets you really good fundamentals, and it gets you really good at reading people's body movements. Like, okay. Just, you know, just kind of hard. No D is basically wrestling with submissions. Like, you're just, you're going, pew, like, you're going. It's the art of strangulation, joint manipulation, all that, man. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot more physically taxing. And if you notice, like, this isn't a shot, you're going to see a lot more older people gravitate towards the D, you know, because it's slower pace. It's more methodical. No D, it's kind of like a sprint, man. And when you see two guys who are excellent at no D, it's beautiful. It really is. It really is, man. You see someone like Marcel Garcia go to work. Who? He's mm, yeah, he's very good. What? I've seen him a couple times. In so, training, how many broken bones have you had? I've probably broken my nose like three or four times, but I've never. Thankfully, I've you know never been too too banged yeah. up. So it's been all good. I've seen. I've had people break their hands like hitting me because I got a blockhead, but that's about about it. Yeah, because I've seen like I mean I know I'm gonna say like a riot favor. I think as I've seen him break his hands like first rounds of fights. I know he did against Mike Brown. He broke both, I believe, in the first one. Oh yeah. And then I know. Oh god, I'm blanking on the second. Khabib, one. even recently. Yeah, Khabib. Broken left hand, still throwing it. Yeah, against Michael Johnson. No savage. I mean, how, so well, we'll just jump into this topic. So when you break something like that, you just the adrenaline just kicks in, and then just you, you just, don't feel it. You just don't feel it. You don't feel it. I've always just wondered that just watching as a fan going like, how do you not feel your hand broke? And you have to go like for another like 25 minutes if you're in like a title fight or, you know, if you're in, is the amateur time different than regular? Amateur is going to be three minute round. 
ones. And so, it's going to be a couple. And it's, the rule set's pretty different now, too. So, like, you can't kick to the head. You can't really ground and pound. There's no knees or elbows. There's no, like, twisting leg locks. There's none of that. It's basically just kickboxing and wrestling. Okay. But even so, like, going into that and then you know you feel like something breaks or something goes wrong. It's just you don't have time to, you know, say, like, oh, time out or, no. you know, anything like that. You just got to go press forward. Yeah, just bite down your mouthpiece and go, well, that didn't work, so let's go. That sucks. Let's do this. Fair enough. It's just a crazy mindset that you have knowing that I got no shame saying I broke a finger. I was in the hospital. I had to get a splint. It was bad. I thought it was a catastrophe. It hurt like hell. I can't lie, but oh, you feel just to think that you've broken your nose and you're like, God, that sucks. I can't breathe out of me. But you know what? You still see the eye ready to go focus. If anything, it just pisses you off more. And just Do you just laugh at it? No, you're just like, ah, like it, to me, it's more just like, well, ah, that really hurt. Let's not do that. Let's 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 not have that happen again. Well, so it's like, well, it's like what, well, I forget what John Jones fight it was, but he got to the end and Joe Rogan went to interview him and they in the octagon yeah. and and they looked down and they're like, oh, your toe's broken. And John's like, oh, hey, look at that. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And Joe's like, oh, can we get this guy medical attention and a stool? <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, I'm good. That's gotta be a crazy mind frame. But let's bring it back to where we we're saying. So your second tournament. You placed second, you yes, said? Yes, second in both divisions. And that was uh, that was just like, oh, man, like, you know, I'm making some headway, making some headway. We're getting better. I was just training like a madman. Well, I, what I thought was like a madman at the time. I was training, like I said, you know, two to three times. I was doing one, at least once a day for about six days a week. So so once a day uh, for like an hour or a couple hours? About two hours. About two hours a day. Two hours. Every every day for six days, take one day off for, you know, rest of the body probably. Yeah. And then going from there, so you got your you know second place finish there for your second tournament that you're in. I mean, that's got to be a huge step from not even placing your first one oh, and kind of yeah. you know just like seeing where the progression, the growth is, and your skill set. Then what's next? What's next? Um, just uh, I heard, I start hearing murmurs of hey, uh, we're gonna get you a fight. So I'm like, all right, all right, that works. I uh, originally was supposed to fight in October of that same year, but I got impentado all around my neck. I had like a necklace of just like nasty funk, and I was gone for three weeks. My coach is like, "Couldn't have you fight." I'm like, "That's understandable." So, and that's like a variation of a staph infection. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, was, just to clarify for our listeners, so it was awful. It was awful, and uh, basically, I was just kind of like, "All right, we'll go back to the drawing board. We're gonna keep training, keep training, keep training." Then it was right around New Year's. It was like a couple of days after New Year's Day. My coach messed, texted me. He goes, "Hey, uh, by the way." Be in shape, get ready. We're going to have a fight for you very soon. So going in the mind frame of, okay, so two years have now gone by. You've gone from 270 pounds yeah. to now you're fighting at? I was fighting stupidly at welterweight. I was fighting at 170. So 170. You've done two tournaments, and now you're getting thrown into your first amateur fight. Yeah. So what's the mindset going into this? To like, like are you, are you going – wow, like things are just moving so fast. I'm like, you know, don't know to like to appreciate the moment in or just kind of like, you know what, this is what I've been meant to do. I feel like this is like not coming second hand, but just kind of like I know this is where my place is supposed to be. It was definitely, it was honestly, it was a combination of the two. It was just to see kind of like all this hard work kind of being rewarded almost and to finally being so close to what I've dreamt about doing. It was just like, it was the best feeling in the world. I can't even describe it to you guys. And it was also at the same time, it's like, you're going to fight. Like You're going to be locked in a cage with another dude, and he's going to try and take your head off. Like, be ready. How was the family's reaction to that, like, when you had to break that news to him? Mom didn't take it well. Dad was like, my dad played sports as well. He's like, oh, well, good luck, kid. Don't be, don't be stupid. All right. <laughs> that sounds like a typical dad response. Yeah. That's awesome. That's all. Yeah, that's great. That's well, great. Well, just don't lose. Just be careful, Vinny. I'm like, you got it, Dad. <laughs> Very nice. And then, so then going into the fight, What's the preparation? What was the thing for the first time that you're like, okay, you know, now I've been working at my craft. I've been putting, you know, the work. I've, you know, coming off a pretty good last performance. What is the mind frame going into this? Basically, it was just, you know what? This is what you want to do at Mega Count. You train so hard. And this is my mindset to this day is you train. I try to train so hard that it's almost, it's almost, you know, I'm not doing myself any favors if I don't perform how I want to. It's I'm doing myself no favors if I don't go out there and perform exactly how I want to perform. So that's how I just looked at him. Like, listen, like you're here every day. You're getting beat up. You're, you know, we wake up in the morning, everything hurts. Like, make this ha- make this count. Make this happen for a reason. So that was just my mindset, and I was just hungry, and I wanted it. I wanted it more than anything in my life, and I still do. But at that time, oh man, Ooh, I was like a dog on a bone, brother. Vincey Atoli, Ocho Doro Parlay Hour. 
that is incredible just you know coming in there and then going to right to the fight day what did you think going in like what's the butterflies going in like you see you see the opponent right across from you you know it's like hey this is not a sparring set session what is your game plan you're just going in like seeing this guy and just eyeing up and going okay first reaction I just, I first of all, I'm looking across at this guy. And this guy's just a specimen, man. I mean, he's just ripped up, shredded like lettuce. And I'm just looking down at me. I look kind of soft and doughy because my saggy skin. You know, you lose 100 pounds in about a year and a half. You're gonna have some saggy skin. So yeah, I was gonna say you're not exactly toned up yet, but you're in, you're in shape going into this. But he's looking at a guy that's looking like he's straight out of the WWE. I'm just looking down. I'm like, huh? I like looked at him. Looked down at me. Looked at him. Looked down at me. I'm like. This must look kind of weird right now. But I'm like, all right, well, it's too late. You know, doors closed. Let's do this. So he comes out, and I remember he just he just jammed me in the face. I was like, oh, okay. Then he hit me with the right hand. I'm like, okay, that works. All right, so then I just shot. I took him double edge right into the cage, took him down, and did that for three rounds. Got my hand raised and bawled my eyes out uncontrollably because that was my dream at the time, and I got to live my dream for that moment, and it was insane. So that began my addiction to fighting and my start of my amateur career. So just yeah, thinking, so you just won by decision. So, I mean, nine minutes of just grueling, you know, imposing your will on your opponent. And then to finally get that moment and you're like, okay, like this is real. Like this is probably one of the most realist experiences you can go through. And then you're like, okay, amateur time is now. What's the, what was the kind of the step that, okay, what do I got to do to change to become better? I just I watched a video of it and I was just like, oh my god! I've always been very critical of myself and just watching the video, I was like, oh man, Ugh, that is capital U ugly right there. I mean, I won, but I was not at all happy. I thought it was really boring. It is only my, my only boring fight that I've had, in my opinion. So I just knew I'm like, all right, we gotta clean up the hands, clean up the jujitsu, just be more confident in yourself, be ready, and then. Months go by. I didn't get a fight for a long, long time. I actually had two fights cancel on me the day of. One, I got a phone call right before wins. It was like, hey, uh, fight's not happening. So I'm like, okay. What was the reasons for that? Well, the one guy, the first guy, the one was right before wins. Um, apparently it rained too hard in Maine, and he was unsure about making the trek to New York. So it was a weather issue per se. We'll go with that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was a, it was a he way. got he someone got scared. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we'll, we'll just roll with that for the you know the. I ain't calling visitation. nobody out. I was no, 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 don't. No. <laughs> but okay, so one guy flakes out day of. Yes. And then the other guy, I had my hands wrapped. I was warming up. I was feeling good. I was feeling confident. All of a sudden, I just the promoter comes in. My coach looks at me. I go, "What's up?" And he just shakes his head. And I go, "No way." He bails out. He like he didn't. I never to this day. I never knew. I really don't want to know. I just, I was like, man, like, damn. Like. And what's that got to do to you? Because, I mean, I, going into the fights, I mean, we typically hear about, you know, fighters need camps to prepare for said opponent. Going into that, how many weeks were you training for each opponent? And then for it to go out, I mean, that's got to just be demoralizing. Oh, it was. It was just, I, I just felt so despondent. I was just over it, man. Uh, it was six to eight weeks, eight, six to eight weeks of just training hard. Like you got to show up, but Oh, guess what? You have to come to practice unless you're sick, unless something's broke, come to practice. So just six to eight days, was, you know, you're cutting weight. You're just, you're feeling like crap, you know, and you get beat up pretty much every night, but you, you know, you're looking forward to There's that reward. There's that, uh, that carrot at the end, you know? And then just to have the rug, it just, the rug gets pulled out from underneath your feet. It's just awful feeling. I wish that on nobody. I've never pulled out to a fight to this day. And then... At this end, or, uh, Jerry, you want to jump in for? No, a I was just saying, just when you when we watch a UFC fight, there's probably a lot of people, unless like the diehard us in the room right now, that may know the grueling punishment, like you said, of a, of a cut. You know, you watch John this weekend; he's going to fight at two o five, but he's rolling around at probably two thirty. Oh yeah, two twenty five, two thirty. So how about what's that struggle like for you? Like, what do you roll around at just on a day, not the just as the common man, the nickname pro- proclaims? What do you troll usually rolling around with? And then a six to eight, how hard is that to cut? And how much weight is it that you have to cut? Normally, I walk around like 80, 85. If that's just like, you know, I'm eating kind of, I'm, I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm enjoying myself and I'm just. Get going. a little double quarter pounder. No, 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 <laughs> God, no, no. No fast food? Oh, God, no. I had Arby's fight the first time ever like a couple months ago. And that was just, that was an awful. It idea. was a shock to the system probably. <laughs> I, I always yeah. say Somebody that would that'd be more so. Because I love Arby's, so I, oh, I could no. eat that all day. But that's just me. Oh, no, it's delicious. But I was just like, 
Oh no! Yeah, you can just feel it. you can just feel that after you <laughs> clean your system out, you just cut all this weight going from two seventy to now you're walking around at one ninety, one eighty five, one ninety, somewhere 185. in there. One eighty five, usually, yeah. And just to go through that progression, I mean, just to think about that. So then, as you're cutting weight for the fights and they're not happening, you know, that's I mean, that's just like as we were saying, it's got to be demoralizing. But then just getting motivated, you know, to do those hard weight cuts and then, you know, all that for nothing, so to speak. I mean, that's just got to just wear on you. It did. I was just like, man, you know, I remember just after the second one got pulled, I'm like, what, what am I doing? Like, maybe this isn't, you know, maybe this isn't the thing to do because this is awful. Like, fighting, fighting's awesome. Fighting's great. But just, man, maybe this just, this isn't, you know, man, it just, I had to, I had a lot of introspection to do. And I was like, you know what? No, no, no. You're going to get a fight. You're going to fight again. You're going to do a thing. So a couple months later, I had my second amateur fight. I lost it. And that was just, oh, man, that that sucked, to be perfectly point blank with you. That was just awful. And, you know, getting the first loss out of the way was good, but at the same time, nobody likes losing. Nobody likes losing. No, I can imagine you put all that work and then just, you know, to come up short. I mean, it's tough, but, I mean, you, every single fighter, I don't think one has ever gone undefeated. No, absolutely not. In the history of time. Absolutely not. And um, it was good to just get that out of the way. And be like, okay, you know, you felt that. You don't want it to happen again. Prepare properly. So then I went on a decent little tear where I won like three fights in a row. Yeah, I won three fights in a row. I beat some tough guys, beat some, you know, I had some pretty decent opposition. I was trying to build a name and lost another fight after that. Um, another couple, won another fight, dropped two. And then it was after I dropped those two in a row, uh, you know, I started cutting down to 155 this time. I was like, you know, I dropped those two and other stuff was happening at the time that I dropped the second one, which I don't put that loss on anything. That was me underperforming. Okay. And I was just like, Maybe, yeah, you know, you're giving you everything you got. Like, you know, you're training hard every day. You're making gains. You know you're getting better, but it's just not showing up. Maybe this maybe this just isn't for you. So you're having, like, another case of self-doubt and just kind of going through the ups and downs because at this point, your record, if I'm doing my math right, was, like, one in th- – three no my record was like five and three no no okay but since no but i'm saying since that um okay so you went on the terror so you yeah. won three in a row and then you lost two i lost the uh, one 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 then i lost two after okay that. all right sorry, sorry no no that. no that's fine no because i'm just trying to make sure i got my numbers right here for you but going through that i mean you're kind of going okay maybe this isn't going through so the doubt is kind of creeping back in that you know like all this hard work that i've been putting in because at this point you're how many years deep in since you decided to do it at least three. At so, least three and a half to four at this point. Okay, so it's three and a half to four years of finally making the commitment, going from 270 down to now you're fighting at 155. To put in that kind of work and that exercise and that motivation and then just kind of saying, like, okay, me, you know, the doubt is creeping in. I mean, I think it's just like as being a fighter is like you're kind of going through, like, not only in a physical battle but in a mental battle as well just to kind of keep yourself keep going. Yeah, absolutely. It was just – it got to the point where I just – I even sat down with James at the time. I'm like – you know, man, like, I don't know, like, maybe this, and he just basically slapped me upside the head and was like, what are you doing? Shut up. What are you talking about? Like, you're great. He goes, you had a couple setbacks. You're here training. You didn't lose. James is your coach. James Rodriguez is my coach at the Crow's Nest MMA. He, uh, he's, uh, one of my close friends also. And that's the reason why I'm so, I've stayed so loyal to him is that we have very similar mindsets. You know, we're very, just very self-driven. We like to train. We like to put the work in, put the grind in. And he was one of those guys where he's like, listen, dude, like, f- fuck those guys. Fuck all the people saying all this shit about you. You're here. You're putting the work in. Good things happen. Good things are going to come. They're on their way. So I was like, all right. And I had a rematch booked um, with the one guy who beat me, Rob Best. It was for the Art of Combat 155-pound title. So okay. we're, for, we're going in that. You know, I was cutting weight on Christmas, which, you know, Oh my so, gosh! At holiday time, you're, you're trying to avoid good food. Oh my! That is the ultimate dedication to your craft. Yeah, I was gonna say that if that's Come not more Christmas ham and it, oh whatever oh, fit, no, if you, lasagna if you're, is. If you're, you're not like, fully all in at this point to make you know make sure that you're con- committed to fighting to miss all that good food, I don't know what else is. I'm just it, gonna sit over here and eat my lettuce. Thanks. Uh dude, I'm like <laughs> eating chicken, and everyone's there's like prime rib, there's ham, there's lasagna, there's like this crazy weird baked potato thing. I'm just like. Yeah, broccoli's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. And um, Amazing. So I go through a very hard camp, and I just – I remember I woke up the day of the fight. I'm like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. I'm gonna, this is going to happen. I just had this feeling. And I went there, went to the arena, and got my hands wrapped, got warmed up, and I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. And then finally, you know, we're out there, and five rounds, man, I bled like a son of a gun. You know, I, and this is your first title shot. No, this is actually my third title Your third shot. title shot, okay. Second one with Rob. 
First one was for like this MMA Expo thing in Syracuse that happened in October. This was fast forward a couple months later in January. First promotion with, or I mean, first title fight against him for a promotion. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, it was just a five rounds grind, man. I remember just being on top of him. I don't know how he made me bleed. I think he like hit me off his back and like my nose just went ploosh. And I'm just like hitting him, hitting him, hitting him, hitting him. And then just as soon as round five came, I knew, like I knew as soon as I got up, I'm like, that was it. That was, that was the one. So got my hand raised, balled my eyes out again and, uh, had a nice little belt to take home with me. And that was, that was, that was, a, that was just an amazing feeling. Was there ever any fear? Cause I know we talk about this all the time about, you know, you hear the famous Dana White quote, don't ever put it in the hands of the judges. Did you ever think at that point that after you got done with that round, you know, something could happen. Oh, always. There's always a little voice in the back of your head saying, mm, Vinny, like, you maybe you shouldn't have done that. Or maybe, you know, because he kind of had me in a bad position at one point in one of the rounds. I'm like, you know, did they score that for him? Like, it's always just this internal monologue you have after, like, you know, you just get nervous until you until the ref brings that hand up. So I was, I always get a little apprehensive when I hear decisions. Fair enough. But so at this point, you got the belt. You're kind of feeling good. We're going to take a quick break. Hashtag Common Man ODPH. We're going to be right back. Round two of the Common Man ODPH episode. So to recap, in case you know you got a little lost track on the music, common man Vince Ciotoli is in studio. He's given us an incredible story of how he started his journey into MMA. Started as a 270-pound teenager growing up, got the motivation, got the bug in him to get off his ass, to get in the gym and just try it. He got drug in there and just basically got addicted is the easiest way to describe it. Lost over 100 pounds within a year. Year and a half. Year and a half. But still, for anybody that's been struggling with weight loss, to you know, dedicate yourself to diet and exercise, to get in there and make yourself a change, and you know, really change every aspect about you. Hard work pays off. The results are in. He's going through his tournaments. He's going through some ups and downs. Going from the first you know successful win to just you know random things happening in life that kind of you know cause doubt to creep in your head. And he's got a good camp around him. People are telling him, you know, don't quit, don't quit. And then finally comes the realization, you know, they're right. I got to get back in there. I got to go knock some heads down. Goes in, gets a title. Where are we going from here? Well, secondly, uh, I was just kind of surveying the options at that point because I knew the uh, Dome Pro was creeping in. I'm like, you know, dude, you've been doing this for how long now? You're not getting paid. You're losing money doing this, you know. So... There's passion plays a big role, but at the same time, man, you know, a little financial reimbursement was going to be clutch. So I had another fight after this one, another title fight. Um, really tough fight, really tough fight. Slobber knocker. Uh, ended up pulling the title off and uh, took the summer off. And I think I, I had to sit down with my buddy, Jam- with my coach, uh, James, and another friend of mine. And we're just like, you know what? Now's the time. It's now or never, buddy. So that moment, you're kind of like, okay, I've won two titles now. Yes. I'm sitting here pretty much on top of the amateur game because, I mean, really as an amateur fighter, there's only so far you can go until you're kind of like, well, this has been a great journey. Maybe it's time to, you know, call it a day being, you know, right on the high horse or say, you know what, I'm not satisfied. I like this is great, but I can do better. And you hear that voice in yourself. And I mean, is that where you kind of were at at that time? Oh, yeah. I was just like, you know what, man, you can do like this is a real thing. Like this is not some far fetched uh you know, outside of the, you know, without your grass. Like, this is, this is, this can happen. This is going to happen. And you're going to make it happen. So I just uh, buckled down, paid, I was patient. I uh, just trained. I was getting better. And then finally one day my buddy calls me and goes, so um, we might have a pro fight for you. Now, to go, to go from amateur to pro, what is the process? Or, I mean, do you just kind of go... I mean, do you have to pay, like, a fee? Do you have to do anything like that? Or do you just kind of go, I declare myself as a pro? Or yeah, is it, or I was going to say, is it the same thing, like, in a professional sport where you've got scouts or you've got somebody pro from, you know, other camps that are pro that are kind of watching, like, man, this kid's really running train through upstate New York. You know, you got to keep an eye out for him, follow him, what have you. And Padawan is currently checking the social media, so remember to check 
hashtag common man ODPH. He's hitting you back as we're taking the interview here with Vince Atoli. Vince. Well, it's uh, and more or less it's, it, it's on your own call. Just about uh, I've had I've seen guys who've had like four or five fights and they've went right to fighting professionally, which I personally disagree with because. You know, yeah, you steamroll a couple chumps, and then you get that one badass from you know across this across the country, and he's coming in with just as good of a camera, just good a record, and it's do or die. But uh, I was a se- at that point, I like thinking of myself, I was more of a seasoned amateur fighter on the on the more seasoned side, and uh, I was like, I got nothing to prove anymore. I got nothing to prove to no one. I'm gonna just I'm gonna get paid. It's time to get paid. It's time to make a little of that money. You know, so. That was basically my mindset going into that. Was I'm like, it's time to show people how good you are. How good you, you know you are. And at this point, this has been five years, roughly. of roughly five years of doing amateur fights, coming, you know, starting from the bottom. Now you're here, if I may quote Mr. Drake. Oh, you may. To just now that you're kind of at that level, you're like, okay, now it's time to go pro. I, and your camp is coming in and saying, hey, we think we have a pro fight for you. What is that moment going through your head? I was like, oh, buddy, because I was. I'll be honest, I was enjoying my summer. I was not eating like I should have. I was partaking in some uh, <laughs> beverages, and uh, I was very heavy when I took that fight. How Dare I ask how much you weigh in? I was 190. So you're 190, and you were fighting. The fight was at what weight class? 155. So you had to cut literally 35 pounds. In a month. In a month. In a month. Okay, break that down to me. That was the most god-awful cut of my life. I will openly admit that right now. It was dumb. I probably shouldn't have done it. But glory, you know, glory is more paramount than being comfortable in life to me. Fair enough. So immediately I started dieting hard. I started really just cutting my carbohydrate, my caloric intake down. I'm doing the water load thing. I'm drinking too. Yeah, I'm wearing sweatpants. I'm doing. I'm training like two to three times a day. And I'm just, the weight's coming off. It's just coming off incrementally. And I'm like, this could be a problem. So at like what point do you, at, at that stage, because when you're dealing with less, so you just completely cut carbs out of your diet. You're just, you know, pretty much drinking water, I would assume. And then when you notice the weight is not coming off, what is the moment right there that you're going, okay, like, what's going to happen now? Like, what's the what's the mindset set going into that? My mindset was, you've made it before. You'll do it again. Don't stress about it. If you stress, your body releases uh, chemicals or something, or and that makes you, you hold on to weight. And when I'm stressed, I eat too. So I was just like, do not get stressed. Don't get stressed, whatever you do. So I just kept trying to work diligently, and eventually the weight came off, and barely, but it was it was the most god-awful cut of my life. I remember sitting at the uh, sauna at Court Jester. It was just, oh, my God, it was awful. We're going in the hot tub. We're going in the sauna, credit card in the sweat off, so you open your pores so you keep sweating. We're doing the Albaline, which is a makeup remover, which opens up the pores so you sweat a lot, and, it, like, the weight's just, like, it's, like, Okay, you're 159.8. Okay, now after doing that for 15, 20 minutes, you're 159.6. So I'm like, oh, my God, look what's going to happen. So then eventually we're on the road, and I'm in the front seat, sauna suit, sweats on, two blankets, ghee top, heat blasting on me, spitting gum, just gum spitting into a bottle. And I'm just, I'm like, all right, it's all going to be worth it. It's all going to be worth it. I get there. I'm 156.2. Oh, my. And the, the weight cut you have to be under is? I had to be 156 even. Even so, even so, you're at point two, so you have to literally lose two ounces. Yeah, the the lady looks at me and uh, she goes, "How much is he over?" I said, "Oh, uh, he's one fifty six point two. She goes, "Go run. We'll see you in twenty minutes." And it was the most miserable twenty minutes of my life, dude. I'm like hitting mats. I'm trying to like uh, do like a drill. With my coach and he's basically just holding up my lip, my like lifeless carcass. Just I'm just a wet noodle at this point. And then I go to the bathroom and we I'm running around in like a circle in like this room. I'm hitting mats and. We go back down there, and it's 156 even. And, brother, let me tell you, never in my life have I ever felt an albatross, like, just get, gotten rid of at that point. I'm like, oh, my God, I could breathe. Because that's just, I mean, crazy to just to put in perspective. You literally cut a pound a day, if not more, to make this fight. Yes. I mean, and that is dedication because, I mean, that's your first pro fight. Mm-hmm. So you obviously don't want to miss weight under any circumstance. No. Because, I mean, that, that would would you say that that would have been a career killer? Yes, I might as well have just take that, taken that professional right off the name tag. And just to lose, a, like, literally a pound a day. I mean, because I know people that are struggling with weight loss, yeah. to let alone, but to go to that level, which, I mean, granted, is very extreme, and we don't recommend. Don't you, do it. Yeah, don't, don't do, do it. 
no, do it gradually through diet and exercise. This is a bit of a different case because obviously this is, you know, fighting comes with a job, comes with weight. I mean, however you want to word that, but still. So you get there, you make weight, the big cloud is off your shoulder. What is next? Relax. It's showtime tomorrow night. Just stay calm. You know what you're doing. You know you've been there. You got you got more time to play. You got more toys you can play with and just enjoy and have it. Embrace them. Enjoy the moment. And is that what you do? Like for a fighter that goes into like the night before, like, okay, so, you know, we, I know we were talking about there's a big pay-per-view card this week. So typically after you make weight, it's just what goes through your head then? Are you just like, are you sitting there thinking, okay, what do I got to do, you know, to, for my opponent? Or are you just kind of like, you know, I'm just going to shut off work because essentially it is work. Yeah. Shut off work for, you know, 24 hours, just veg out and just lose yourself. Is that kind of what the mind frame is, or do you just uh, like, no, I got to look at tape, I got to get stay focused, I can't lose? It depends on from fire to fire. I just, I personally, I'm just like, you know what, we're gonna go have a good meal, just gonna get a good night's sleep, and wake up, have a nice breakfast, and just we're gonna relax until uh, we, until it's time to go show up. That's basically what I try to do with every uh, cut I've had. I'm just like, you know what, it ain't nothing different, man. You just you're punching into work. But that first one though, so you're like, okay, I'm a pro. This is really happening. Like the dream is here. Oh, yeah. Win, lose, draw. You're at the dance to quote Paul Heyman <laughs> way back when. What is going through? So you're coming in, you're getting hands wrapped, you're talking with the coaches. What are they telling you? What's the family thinking? What is what is everybody around you saying at this point? Everyone around me is just like they're just as juiced up as I am. They're like, because I was the first one to just break everyone else to kind of preface it with a bad story there have been a couple opportunities for other people in the in the gym to go pro and they just they didn't pan out and this is at crow's nest this was at the crow's nest okay. and there was some shady stuff with a athletic commission in a certain state which i'm not going to get into because i don't want to bury those guys but there's some shady stuff and everyone we were just kind of like starting to do like where do we go from here and then i was the first one to be like all right go so i think everyone was just really excited we were all we were all really pumped and amped and happy and then the day came and we're like all right just this is your moment. Go enjoy it. And here we go. So going into there, now did you, now it's a common question I think Pad was asking on the break. Do you get to choose your theme song? Because he I, he is a very big music aficionado yeah. for p- choosing our shows. Normally you do get a little choice with the walkouts on, not for this particular promotion for like certain legal reasons, and I get that. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't even pay attention to the music anymore. I just there's I focus on the task at hand. No, I know, because I know when we watch UFC, we like to pay attention, especially on the pay-per-view cards, we like to pay attention to who's coming out to what. Oh, yeah. Because you've got some guys who are coming out like, oh, okay, you know, you've got your wide men. You know. Which, dare I say, t- quickly, this week he did fight uh, Calvin Gesslem. Anybody else here watch the fight, and did you freak out when he did not come out to Tom Petty right he away? A little bit. No, he threw a curveball. Because I know everybody was kind of a little busy because it was the lowest rated Fox fight card, which I heard, at least Bisping posted something about that on his Instagram. Anyway, regardless, he comes out to something else. It was like uh, Empire State of Mind by Jay-Z. Yeah. Oh. So all of a sudden, like I think I've never seen Twitter explode from the MMA things going, where's Tom Petty? Where's Tom Petty? Where's Tom Petty? And then finally it kicks in to God. Tom Petty. And it was like, okay, all's right with the world because that was just like – I remember seeing with our illustrious uh, fantasy guru pick, Nostradamus, and he was like, what? Like, just could not wrap his head around, like, what happened, so. Yeah, I mean, there's certain fighters you expect to come out to certain songs. When they throw a curveball, you're like, uh, oh, yeah. uh, is this going to work? Uh, Anderson's always going to be Ain't No Sunshine. Yeah. yeah. He's always going to be Ain't No Sunshine. But, no, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to uh, pick my walkout songs lately, which is okay, because, I mean, if you're too, if you get too wrapped up into certain things, it just takes your focus off the test at hand. Gotcha. So as you're going to the cage, first pro fight, obviously the jitters have got to be there. got to be butterflies. I mean, going in, this is like now you're at your dream. This is what's happening. You go into the cage. You see your opponent. Did you know that much about your opponent before going in? Or Oh, yeah. we we uh, This is actually a fight I won as an amateur at the time. Like I, I'm okay. like, I know our pass on the cross. I know it's going to happen, but he ended up going pro when he did. And I waited around a little bit longer. I, had, I did some things, and uh, – then it happened. I'm like, okay, so this is just uh, this is just another fight, man. Just relax. Like it's not like you're going in there and you're fighting some guy from TriStar or something, you know? Yeah. So as you're going in, how's the fight going? Give us the breakdown. The fight comes out. Um, he did exactly what we thought we were gonna do, and I I remember I just clipped him with like a lead hook, and his chin went bloop. Like he did like his head turned around and he shot right off that. I'm like, okay, I knew that was coming. First round was back and forth, and then the second round, and I just I look, I'm looking at him in between rounds, and I'm like, he's tired. 
He's put him away. You know you have him kind of breaking at that I, point. I know he's I know he's more tired than I am. I'm I'm still pretty fresh. I'm ready to go. I'm looking at him. I'm like, all right, that's it. This round's it's ending this round. So I came out, pa 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 pa, hit him with a few punches, take him down, get out of a guillotine, get some work on him. He sat up, and I never hit a smoother guillotine in my life. Can't let me tell you that high elbow one never hit, never hit one smoother in my life. And then he tapped, and I'm like, oh man, that just happened. Now you're here, pro one yeah. and oh. I imagine is that's got to be like the, one of the sweeter victories of record, if not the sweetest. I, I, you know, I, I say this. I've never, I'm not married. I've never had children. That was the greatest night of my life. Just going into that, just, just knowing right. that all the, just the journey to recap. So five years going from 270 to you're fighting now at 155. 155 to get there, to go in the cage, to all the amateur, all the hard work, learning everything. Going in there and now winning at the pro level is just got to be incredible. It was the most surreal and realist moment. It was the most surreal and real moment of my life. I'm like, holy crap! I'm like, this that happened. This was this is a thing. Yeah. So from here on out, it's like you're now officially a pro fighter. You're a professional mixed martial artist. Now the fun begins. Now the fun begins. So where do you go from there? Well, uh, hit a hit a little robot. My last fight, I uh, you know I got I got submitted. He was a good guy. He was a really good fighter. So uh, I was I'm and that just I've never been hungry for a fight in my life as I am right now coming into this fight. I've trained camps been going awesome. I've been working. I've been training two to three times a day. Just hungry tunnel vision, man. Like this, that loss was the best thing for me in a way. To get you motivated because now you know okay you're at this level. The competition is going to be tougher. Yes. There's going to be you know more things going on in your head that you you're going to have to constantly battle. And now you're going into this August twelfth, Seneca Niagara Casino, mm-hmm. King of the Cage promotion. Yes, sir. So big fight going down is not going to be. On, is it going to be on the internet by chance? Or? Um, it's going to be. It's going to air on tape delay on Mav TV. Okay. Mav TV. If anybody's got Mav TV, I don't know who's got it, but if you got it. In about six weeks' time, after August twelfth, you're gonna see me beat this guy. Beat this guy up. He's he's fired up. He's motivated. He's ready to do it. I mean, it's gotta be just an incredible feeling. Just especially now that you're coming off your last loss. That you know now it's like this is extra motivation. Now you know the training has amped up more. I mean, are oh, yeah. you are you trying to get more focused on, you know, uh, certain areas of you know mix, or mixed martial arts, or is it just you know pretty much the basics? We're just we're uh, we're sharpening every we're sharpening every stone, man. We're uh, getting everything nice and clean. We're making. Oh, you want to be good? I want to be good everywhere. My James always tells me, "Was you can have it all, you can have it all," and I agree with him. And there's no reason why anyone in this day and age can't be good at everything in MMA. There's, to me, there's no reason. And if you want it, it's gonna happen. Do you think that you ever have to like leave for another camp to learn it, or you think everything you can get right at Crow's Nest? I get a lot. I get everything, da- damn near everything at Crow's Nest. But sometimes, you know, going to train elsewhere, it's not a bad thing. We don't frown upon that. Like we'll go hit up. Uh, we got our man, D- Evil Dan Colville, down in uh, New York City. He's okay. the, he's the man. Uh, vicious jujitsu, ferocious jujitsu black belt, just sinister. We got uh, we got our boys in uh, Rochester, uh, New York, Ten Planet. We got our boys in Elmira. Fi- Five element MMA. We got Oniana Jiu Jitsu. We got some guys we can go train with. You know, we get different looks. It's nothing but love. You know, with we we get a uh, got a good network going. Uh, absolutely, because I, I mean, I think uh, you you know not otherwise you would grow like stagnant. I mean, yeah. just you know, which which is not a disrespect to anybody on your team, obviously, but it's like you know when you keep seeing the same opponents every day in the gym, it's like to get a breath of fresh air and get a kind of a different perspective. Right. You Although, get somebody maybe who's a little bit faster you haven't seen in a while, gives you a little bit of better practice. Maybe somebody who's a little sharper in their skills. Oh no, no doubt, no doubt. I'm a firm believer that you know you never want to be the best guy in the room, but you never want to be the worst guy either. You want right. to kind of walk that. Kind of be at that that margin right there where you you always want to stay hungry. Well, and like you like you said earlier in the interview too, you know you think back to okay, so if you fought at the same you know you're at the same camp, you spar with the same guys, but like you said before, you know you're the best guy in the state, but then you get that kid from California who's twice as hard, he's hitting 15 gyms, he's sparring with anybody and everybody he can, and then you just get trucked, and then it gives you that sense of like, oh shoot, I'm not even close. No, yeah, man, you never want to. I'm a I'm a firm believer. I got to say it's uh, complacency breeds contentment, and uh, you never want to be content. No, or, no, it's contentment breeds complacency. Sorry, I'm getting my own saying mixed up. No, no, no worries, no worries. CTE. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, just kidding, everyone. No, we're good. But uh, uh, you know, compla- contentment breeds complacency, and um, you never want to be comfortable. I like to, I like to think so. I try to make myself as uncomfortable at times as I can. 
Let me throw this one at you. Uh, somebody approaches you, hypothetical, completely, and says, we will bring in any MMA star to train with you for your training camp. Who do you bring in? Frankie Edgar. Ooh. There we go. Answer, man. Ooh. Ain't nobody better. Ain't nobody does it better, in my opinion. Very close second is El Cucu Wee, Tony Ferguson. Ooh. Is really? Sleep? Freaks don't sleep, brother. No, I mean, I, <laughs> it's... <laughs> He's hey, the man. No, there's nothing wrong with those picks. I mean, Frankie is definitely one of my favorites. So, and I could definitely two-time champ. Well, he, pro- no, is he interim champ now at the UFC? No, or no? no, no, it's all Holloway. He's got yeah. the title shot. He's going to be fighting Holloway though. See, that's the one problem with the UFC right now because they have so many multiple titles. Oh my God, it's, it's, it's like trying to keep track of everybody. It's like I can't tell who's a champion or not. Bisbee's fighting. No, Bisbee's not fighting GSP. Good, so he's going to fight Whitaker. Awesome. The interim yeah. champ's going to fight the real champ. There was something posted. Whitaker is out for 2018. Uh, or until 2018. So now that's that was coming out late breaking as I was reading here. So I'm trying to get confirmation of that. I know I mentioned about it last week. Um, Pad's looking right now on the computer. So hopefully you dig it up. I believe it's on Fox Sports if I'm not mistaken. But getting back to the point. So perfect, you know, example of you know trying to get you know better. I mean, so after the fight on the 12th, what's next? Or are you even looking that far in advance? Or is it like nope? After the 12th, this is it. This is all I need to worry about right now. I'm focused on the task at hand. I mean, what's going to happen is going to happen after that regardless. Um, if I get opportunities to keep fighting for Candid Cage, if another promotion offers me, you know, uh, pay or something like that, yeah, I'll fight wherever. You know, I'm not signed to a contract to anyone. Uh, I like fighting for Candid Cage. I think they run a great show. It's a great product. But uh, I'm like a mercenary, man. I, that's how I like to think of myself. I just, you know, you give me money, I'll go fight. So after that, ultimate plan, where do you see the career going? Honestly, man, I just want to fight the best. I want to be the. I want to be great, and I want to fight the best guys in the world. And I'll go wherever I got to go to fight. If I got to go to Bellator, you know, throw hands with Michael Chandler one day, we'll do it. If I got to go to UFC and I got to, you know, run the ringer in there, you know, get that big old Russian guy one day, it might happen. It did happen. You know, Justin Gaethje and I are into a slobber knocker. It did happen. But right now, man, I just want to be. I want to just show people how great I am. I want to show people how great I am at this level and there, and I want them to have no choice but to realize that, yo, this kid's pretty good. That's awesome. Got to give him his due. That is amazing. Vince Atoli, Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We're going to take a quick break and come back up and wrap up the show, but definitely hit us up on that social media, hashtag CommonManODPH. Folks, we are back, round three, with the common man. That is hashtag ODPH common man. Bringing in round three, we're going to go over UFC 214. Normally, if you're an avid listener to the show, we have our pad picks. Pad taking a back seat here. Going to give the floor to the common man. I will I will give the floor to him. I feel honored. I don't, so, think, I don't think you really have a choice if I you mean, push came to shove. From, so, what, just from say, what we've bro. heard in this epic story, money on the common man. But I'm just saying. Well, Pat is taking his steps into pro wrestling, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> we'll save that but, one for next week. But who better to talk about the MMA card this weekend than the pro MMA fighter in our distance here? So, Pat, hit him off. Uh, first off on the main card, you've got uh, the light heavyweight fight between Jimmy Manoa and Volcan. I'm going to go Volcan, man. I think he's younger. I think he's hungrier. He's on a really good streak right now. Manoa's good. Don't get me wrong. Manoa's a stud. But if he doesn't clip you with that body shot overhand, I feel like Volkan's got more weapons. He trains with a really good camp in uh, Florida, and I, I think he's in. I think the young lion's going to bring it. Oh, okay. Uh, next up, we've got the welterweight fight between Robbie Lawler and Donald Cerrone, which could easily headline any other card. You know what? Ruthless for life, man. I think. I sadly, I think uh, big fight Cerrone's going to show up, and Robbie's just going to get in there and do his thing. Ooh, okay, uh, then you've got your first of three, count them, three title shots. Uh, you've got the women's featherweight title between Cyborg and Tonya Evinger. Cyborg. Oh. Cyborg. Cyborg by... Uh, by Decapitation, oh, uh, okay. murder, maiming, whatever you want to call it, really. I feel like anybody, all bloggers all over the place, there's, there's no shot here 
No. With with Cyborg. No. And then you almost just wonder, like, man, why even have the fight? You just kind of feel bad. Would you, would you throw down five bucks on Tonya, though, just, just in case? No, man. Just because I no. am? Yeah. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know what the odds are, but I might throw five. I would throw five bucks There's down not. just because. You might have to check that up as soon as you get off the computer to you know open up another spreadsheet. I, it's possible, but I tell you what, this division is tailor-made for Cyborg. Cyborg's on a whole other level than most uh, women MMA fighters right now. So it, I just can't see it going any other way than Cyborg is just going to go completely run through Tanya. Absolutely. Without question. I mean, that's... Absolutely. Yep. Uh, then you've got your co-main event, the welterweight fight between Tyron Woodley, the champion, versus Damian Maya. You know what, man? This is the one I just I'm having a hard time picking because yeah. on one hand, Damian's gonna do what Damian's gonna do, and you ain't gonna be able to stop it. On the other hand, though, if you look at uh, Woodley's fight with Andre Galvao back in Strike Force, Andre Galvao, one of the best grapplers in the world all time, arguably. What he happened? Couldn't take him down, couldn't jits him, and he ate just the right hand. Yep. So at the same time, you know, I think Damien's only been knocked out one time by Mark War. Yep, yep. He's only been put to sleep one time, and he's just a different animal at 170. He's just a bigger guy. He's bigger, stronger. He's savvier. Who knows? I push comes to shove, though. Gun to my head. Damien, gotta go, Damien. Okay. And then only you're... only to backtrack real quick. Cyborg minus 1300. Ooh. To a to a plus 900. Ooh. That's different. Oh yeah. <clears throat> I'm Ooh, thinking. I'm, th- I'm thinking yeah. a five spot. Eh, why not? Yeah, yeah, just because might... the payout's a lot. Dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's only a couple it, dollars. It, you know, only... five turns into five grand. But that's fine. Yeah. yeah. If, if well, only small money. <laughs> crazier things have happened. <laughs> yeah. yep. Stranger things have happened. Yep. Wood- Woodley, the favorite in that one too. By the way. Oh yeah. Two twenty. Yeah. And then your main event, your PA State Resistance, if you will, uh, John Jones versus Daniel Cormier. This is gonna make a lot of people locally really upset, but you know what? DC's my boy. I've been a fan of him forever. Let's wow. go, DC. Mic drop. See, now here's the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on your. I'm gonna. <laughs> oh no! Oh, here now. we hold go. On. Here hold we on. go. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I did it now. No, hold on. <laughs> I see. Locally, I don't now. In in 2017, I don't think people locally would be as mad ab- about that. Is if it unless it were like back in say 2013, 2014, because you look at everything that has happened with John Jones up to this point, getting pulled from 200. The car accidents, the this, the that, and all the legal troubles. There are far less people on that bandwagon than there were three, four years ago. There is a lot of, we know a lot of people who would root for him and say, hey, great, awesome. Now, eh, not so much. I think, too, a lot of people hate Daniel Cormier mm, for whatever yeah. reason. I mean, I think he's a, just a stand up dude, great guy. I think I think it's the same reason like people don't like Bisbing in the, in the sense that you have guys that they do talk, mm-hmm. but they back it up. And I think that somehow, like, the delivery comes out disingenuous. Yes, I agree with that. I think that that's why, because, like, DC is a great fighter. But I think that, you know, when he he says something and it's, you know, maybe not, I don't want to say cool, but if he just says something that, you know, like, about Grady is, it comes off like, oh, look at you, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, he's like every other fighter. He's just not real slick about it. He just kind of says, you know, this is who I am and this is what I do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me personally, I always hope he does well, but that's, you know, because... John, you mean? John, yeah. I hope he does well. That's because, you know, I went to the same high school he did. He was a year or two ahead of me. I met him. You know, I as, I a, as a fellow alumnus of Union Endicott High School, oh. I always hope he does well. Now, that's not necessarily meaning I'm rooting for him or saying, hey, go out there and win, but it's like, hey, I hope you do well. No, I, and I get that, too. I mean, you know, you got to have... There's always going to be that hint of local pride at the yeah. fact that, hey... Someone from here made it out. They did it, but in my estimation too, I just you know what, man. He's a great, he's a good fighter, but it's, I just you know he let a lot of people in yeah. this area down, and he's just shown a not so great character. In my opinion, this is strictly my opinion. Don't come after the guy. This he just he's <laughs> don't just, come after it. Don't now he's backtracking. Here he is. He's just I just it's not a great character in my in my estimation. I don't think that's someone that you want holding the belt. DC, I mean former Olympian, family man. Does this thing out there? I mean, that's just strictly my opinion again, but I don't know. That's just what—that's the side of the fence I come down on, man. I, you know, Ken, I've talked to Ken about this off podcast yeah. and on on shows with DC. 
I, you know, the hating at DC, he, yeah, the family guy, I get it, but man, he's just, he's walking around like the kid who stole, like, got you in trouble and took your bike. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, he's, he's riding your bike and you took the fall for it and he's like, yeah, whatever, I'm just a badass. But, mm. I can see it. I mean, it, it, I can see it, it, I'm not saying it fell in his lap, don't get me wrong. He did what he had to do to get the belt when Johnny was left. Mm -hmm. They had the title fight. He won it, absolutely. He's only got the one loss to Jones. But, I mean, he's walking around like, oh man, big man, I can't, what, you, you didn't beat him. No, but I... That's my only my only tip to him. is like, hey, listen, I love the vote of confidence. I love the badass mentality. You know, listen, my shit doesn't stink. I'm good. Yeah, you, but, you've proven yourself. But if John, yeah, did, if John but didn't listen, screw if you, up... You, you lose twice. You know what I mean? Like, if you, if you lose again, man, it just proves the point that, like, yeah, you know what? You can, you can roll 205, but there's one guy. One guy you can't get through. This is going to be like, if you remember the commercials, I'm not saying it's the same kind, but if you remember the commercials for the fight between Jake Shields and GSP, Ooh. where you have somebody's face <laughs> in your locker every day, and that is your benchmark, and that is the only thing that is driving you to at, at this level, that is that person and you need to beat that person. That is my opinion of DC because, you know what, he has been getting dogged ever since John had his issues and was stripped of the title, mm, yeah. what have you. The only thing he's been hearing, even though he has been defending his belt, is you didn't beat John. I think he's going to come in with the biggest chip on his shoulder. Oh, yeah. And this is it. I'm not saying he's going to immediately retire after, but this is his career on the line. This is going to be him going, you know what? If I beat him, I solidify, solidify myself as one of the greatest of all time mm -hmm. because of my tracker, but I beat the guy. If he loses, I don't know where he goes from here that, because it's true, man. Like you said, that's the fear with Jones, though, is you, you know Cormier's made a mock of, you know, this whole run and Johnny doing the coke and the car accidents and he's made it very public and insults him and even in the ring when he's oh it's gotten real defended. messy yeah it's, it's got gotten, it's gotten messy. sloppy but like you said his John's face is in his locker my only question for John is is he got that same mentality or is he like man I'm just gonna truck him again I, like I he's just he he's holding my belt and that's that's my only fear going into it is like I mean yeah I'm gonna pick Jones because I think he is but that's my one fear is that he's kind of like man I'm gonna just roll him take my I, belt see, back and I get think, in that mentality I think John might and this is just me spitballing off the top of my head because DC's heard, yeah, you're good, but you didn't beat John, yada, yada, yada. But John, at the same token, has had everyone going about how much he screwed up, right. about everything he did wrong, and, oh, you're a, you're a screw-up, you're a fuck-up, you were on top of the world, you had this, right. you had that, you had a six-figure, you know, you had a six-figure ad deal, this, that, and the other. And he's like, you know what, yeah, I had it all, yeah, I screwed it up, I want to come back and prove you wrong. The one thing, too, if I may add, John's had one fight in how many years? Yeah. That, I yeah. DC's been that. active. Yeah. DC's been doing the thing. Like, you can say what you want about that grappling match with Dan Henderson. It, no. That's a different ballgame. It's a different game. DC's been active. He's been in the thing. He's been in the grind. He's he's fired up. He's ready to go. The way I see this happening, man, I think John's going to come out like a ball fire first two rounds. Just, you know, put it on him a little bit. He's going to start to fade in round three. And DC's going to grind his ass for the next three rounds. And he's going to go It's gonna go three and two. And it's going to be 29-28 DC. Mm. Hold yeah. me to it. I don't care. No, no. We're going to make sure we post these on the on the Facebook page when we get done and on Twitter, too. We're going to hit this pretty hard with social media. I, the only thing that worries me about John coming back in this is I've seen a couple interviews where they've done, like, the stand, you know, face by face. I don't know if John is necessarily – I don't want to say motivated because I don't think that's the right word. But just seeing the demeanor of how he's answering and stuff. And he's, Arrogance. Yeah. It's like – He's almost thinking he's going to come back in, and I'm not saying he's not going to put a full effort in, but it's almost like when I hear DC talk, I can hear the hunger, and like he sounds like a guy, you know, like much when you were talking about you doing your amateur and how hungry you were. I mean, DC's at this stage, and he's still sounding hungry, like, I need to win this. John is coming in, and I don't want to say he's nonchalant, but I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm hearing him going, oh, FDC, and you know, all that jazz. But I'm not seeing, like, that hunger come in. Well, now, like, well, like you said, I mean, the last fight he had a tomato can that he just beat around the octagon for five rounds. He had to put the, fear of, he put the fear of God in him several times. It well, could have killed him, he, but he, let him go. And, he implant, yeah. Against OSP, he did really implement his will. Yeah. Like, he, I'm not saying, yeah, it wasn't like. No, but he, no, but he did look sloppy. 
Yeah, he did look he's, sloppy. He, he still looked, looked really sloppy, sloppy, which makes you nervous going into Cormier. Yeah, because, court, like you said, D.C. is focused. Like, D.C. is not going to come in there, and D.C. is not going to play around with him. No. D.C. is going to march across the cage, get in his face, and try and, to chuck him. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's the thing. But then what's going to be the game plan if he can't do it? That's good. See, that's that's where your fight is really going to make the thing. Can, can D.C. I, – I know he can't outstrike him. There's no, no way no, about it. No. But can he – because now he's the champ. He, he's going to be the – almost the judge's favorite because as a champion you're the favorite going in if it comes down to a close decision i think dc takes it just because john i think needs to win decisively it can't go to the judges but he needs to like put the whooping on dc agree no there's no question like he needs to make a statement fight like if he somehow knocks him out in the first 30 seconds the, the case is closed discussion is done but if it goes to deep water, I like DC to win. Yes. But if I have to make a prediction, I think John to reclaim any kind of legacy is going to come out and he's going to pull something out. Now, I mean, like you say, gun to the head, got to make a split decision this moment. I'm going to say Jones, but I will tell you what, I will not be shocked at all. If DC pulls this off, because I think DC is going to be hungrier and I think he's going to be more motivated to really, this is his legacy. I agree. Yeah. So it all depends on what happens. And if John, like I said, the interviews, maybe he's playing coy and maybe he's just, you know, doubling down and just, yeah, it could just be him on, you know, playing on maybe. the surface. Cause I mean, like, and I think I've been very vocal about this. Like he just needs to really stay off Instagram, stick to fighting and just get focused. Yes. So you come in there and, and if you are the John Jones of old, you show up like the John Jones of old. You know, to, to almost kind of like hit like a, a comparison, this is almost like Tyson Holyfield like one. Yeah. It's, you know, don't, Tyson's got something to prove. Like he's got something to prove. Well, like everyone is always like, oh, well, you're good, but you never beat him. This is it for me. Like this, this is that fight. Yeah, I agree. It's Tyson Holyfield. No, yeah, yeah, I mean, I know, Ken, you've said that to me off show, you know, various times. And I know I've said this to you. He almost needs to go like LeBron James does when he's going into the playoffs. As soon as the playoffs starts, you look at LeBron's Twitter, zero dark 23, he's off. Yeah, he needs to. He's see. not looking at anything. He's not posting anything. He's not doing anything. Jones, like, I don't know when, the week of, two weeks of, whatever, needs to go zero dark whatever and just off. Yeah, he, he, I, I, think, I think so because he has the reputation – and, you know, whatever your opinion of that is, is that is your opinion. But he needs to get focused on fighting. If he Because the thing that worries me a little bit about his focus, what was the big headline this week? Brock Lesnar. Oh, oh yeah. You are looking past D.C. to focus on Brock Lesnar, who's still six months away from even being a free agent. No, no, not even free agent. Out of the Usad up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got – I mean, why are we even talking about that? Like, you're in the biggest fight that you've had in, what, two, three years? At he's, least. Yeah. yeah. At least. Yeah. Why the heck are you even talking about Brock Lesnar when you need to beat DC? It's It could be, the, you know, I think um, his greatest detriment is going to be his – or his biggest, you know – the weakness is bitten is, is it's gonna be his detriment. His confidence, which has been you know, which he's exuded since day one, he's always had that confidence about my things and be his downfall in this fight. I think he's gonna go in there. He's you know, he's old, he's you know, he's fat, he's Carl Winslow, whatever. I'm gonna wash this guy, and here's Carl my, Winslow ain't gonna come to play. I yeah. hate to tell you, brother. Here's my only question because I genuinely don't know when he said this, was this a, he was spitballing off the top of his head, or did some reporter go, Who would if you know, after DC, who would you like to fight? There was a rumor, I think. No, no, no. Uh, okay. he, he got he got asked if if you check it up, he got asked at a, a press conference with him in DC. Okay. Um, Dana, I think Dana was um talking about it because he was saying something like he hasn't talked to John and all that jazz. But there was something, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, he did read it. But yeah, somebody did because it was all okay. over. Okay. But yeah, but still, it's like okay, you gotta get focused on your fight, and that's what you need to close out with. End of story. John needs to win decisively. I think he's going to, but like I say, I'm not doubting DC. No. Coming in no. and making a statement because I think DC is going to be like you've been gone for that many years or a year now at least. Well, yeah, at least a little. Up, so exactly. you've been gone. You 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 stuck it out against OSP. I'm not OSP. I'm the champ. You're not going to take this on me. Yeah, agree, hundred percent. And end the story with that. We're going to have all our picks on our Facebook, on our Twitter. Make sure you hit us up on there, Facebook Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. 
the Twitter OD Parlay Hour. Vince, thank you for coming on the show, yeah, man. It has been a pleasure. Awesome. What an interview. Uh, any final shout-outs you want to give before you, we sign off for tonight? Uh, let me get a shout-out to uh, my gym, my homies, my brothers, Crow's Nest MMA, Binghamton, New York. Come give us a shot. Uh, Thirsty Threads Inc., my man, Fred Willis. I love you, brother. Freddy. Freddy. Freddy Positivity. Sound Around Investor. If you like stuff, they got it. Come check it out. Sound Around. Jay's been really good to me. He's my main man. And just thank you to everyone for tuning in and uh, having in the ODPH guys for having me here. This was awesome. Absolutely, we can't wait to have you back on. You know, when you, after your fight here, and you know, give us a little shout. And you know, as I said, we're gonna be watching August twelfth, Seneca Niagara Casino, King of the Cage. Vinny's throwing down. If you're not familiar, get familiar. You, do you want to? If you want to throw out your Instagram, you can. V C O M M A at Instagram. Yes, hit him up. Make sure you give a follow. Show him some love, folks. On behalf of Jr. Sound Guy Galore. Padawan J, the common man, Vince Ciotoli. I'm Ken M. Thank you for listening to the ODPH. We'll see you next time.